excited. Thank you so much for joining us this Wednesday night for Mozart in Paris with Gil Harrell. Gil, I don't feel like he needs an introduction, but for any newbies out there, Gil is a musicologist and a music theorist. Currently, he teaches at Naugatuck Valley Community College, where he was presented with the Merit Award for Exemplary Service to the college. While he's there, he wears many hats. Um, he conducts the college chorale, he, um, the a cappella assemble, he teaches music history and theory, and he serves as the musical director of theater productions. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our collections available to the community. So tonight, this is a webinar. You can see our beautiful faces. We can't see your beautiful faces. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A or the chat and we'll get to it. And now I'm gonna pass the mic over to Gil. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you everybody for being with us here this evening. What a pleasure to get to share the amazing history of Mozart's life and specifically this very specific episode that comes to us uh, from the late 1770s when Mozart spent a couple of years on the road, uh, mostly in Paris. And it was a disastrous trip, uh, one that ended in heartbreak and um, in fact, tragedy by the end of it. And he sort of skulked back to his hometown of Salzburg with his tail between his legs uh, before embarking on the final chapter of his life, which would be his time in Vienna as a freelancer through the 1780s. But before we get there, I wanna begin this program with a question. Question is, how might we define the word miracle? I ask that because Leopold Mozart, Mozart's father, we're gonna look at a picture of him in just a moment, a portrait, described his son in 1761 in exactly that language, a miracle. What is a miracle? I think it's fair to say that a miracle might be thought of in the following terms. A miracle is something which is impossible. And yet, it happens. What Leopold Mozart witnessed in January of 1761 could only have been described as a miracle by him and by anyone else who witnessed it. What he saw was his not yet five-year-old son clamber up onto a harpsichord bench and play music, not in the way that a toddler who's especially precocious might pluck out thirds or other consonant intervals, but actually played what his older sister, nearly five years his senior, had been playing during her lesson. Leopold must have done a double take. How is that possible? The boys never had an official lesson. Uh, even the most precocious children don't usually begin formal instruction until they're five or six. And that was the same back in the 18th century as it is today. But somehow the young Wolfgang, Wolfie, Amadeus, beloved of God, Latin would be Theophilus, um, was able to do exactly what I just described. And his father, who was a professional musician, understood better than the average person that what he was witnessing was not only highly unlikely, but in fact, really impossible. Nothing like that had ever been recorded, certainly not something that Leopold Mozart would have come across. And it wasn't something he could fathom. And therefore, the word miracle was the only word he could conjure up to describe exactly what he had witnessed. Many of you might know this, but Leopold um, was something of an enterprising musician and decided to take his kids on the road. He and uh, Anna Maria Mozart, his wife, had seven children, lamentably only two survived into adulthood. That sort of thing was not uncommon in the 18th century. Recall that Bach is uh, famous for having sired 20 children. It's not exactly uh, true, but nonetheless, uh, fewer than half of them survived to adulthood. So Mozart and his sister, also named Anna Maria Mozart, but better known to posterity by her pet nickname, Nanerl, uh, were both brilliant, brilliant keyboard virtuosi. And so Leopold took them on the road. They traveled the various roads of Europe through uh, Austria, obviously, their native country, to Germany, to France, even across the channel to England back across the channel to the Netherlands. And eventually in the early 1770s, when Wolfgang was entering his teenage years, they wound up in Italy for uh, three years on and off. And that was where Mozart, that is to say Wolfgang Mozart, began to have his great early triumphs. The concert motet, Exultate Jubilate, a piece written for a very famous castrato of the time, uh, 
an individual by the name of Venanzio Razzini, one of the few castrati that Mozart got along with. Mozart tended to uh, have uh, quarrels with these castrato uh, singers, many of whom uh, must be said, uh, come off to us in the literature as great um, prima donnas or um, divas. You know, the, this language that we use is actually a, adapted from uh, operatic terms and, and the castrati of the 18th century were the big opera star. So I sort of use those terms deliberately. After returning from Italy in 1773 on this final childhood journey, Mozart found himself sort of adrift. He's living in his hometown of Salzburg, but he doesn't have the kind of job that would be commensurate with his talent and skill set. After all, he spent his youth proving to the rich and famous aristocrats and nobility of Europe that this child is one to watch. And yet, what happens to a child prodigy as they grow older? They're no longer a child prodigy. The term in German is Wunderkind. Wunder, of course, means wonder, and kind, as in kindergarten, means child. But if you take the kin part out, and all you have is a, an exceptionally gifted, say, a teenager, it doesn't have the same shimmer, the same luster, the same resplendent quality as, say, a six-year-old playing the same repertoire with the same facility and ease. And therefore, Mozart found himself, as I said earlier, sort of adrift in his hometown of Salzburg. It must be said, Mozart didn't like his hometown very much for a number of reasons. First and foremost, there was no opera there. Mozart, by his teenage years, opera had been cemented as sort of the genre that was closest to his heart. On top of that, Salzburg was where his father lived. And let's face it, we, those of us who have read a little bit about uh, Mozart's biography, we know that Leopold Mozart is a polarizing figure in the history books. Depending on which biographer you read, whether it's Jane Glover or Hildesheimer or Otto Erich Deutsch or some of the newer biographies, I'm going to mention one which I would recommend uh, since we're uh, collaborating. I'm collaborating this evening with the wonderful, awesome Darien Library. Um, it's my turn to plug the library ever so briefly and um, point out that there's a new Mozart biography that was just published last year uh, by a wonderful musicologist by the name of Jan Swafford. And it's called Mozart, colon, a reign of love. Strong recommend. Mozart, colon, a reign of love by Jan Swafford, S-W-A-F-F-O-R-D. So um, the biographers sometimes differ in, in their treatment of Leopold Mozart, but nonetheless, he remains a polarizing figure. And I think it's fair to conjecture that Mozart was not too excited about being back as a teenager in Salzburg under his father's rather oppressive thumb and constantly hearing about how he should be employed in the great courts of Europe, uh, collecting a massive salary that would be commensurate with his skill level. That simply wasn't the case. In fact, in the mid 1770s in Salzburg, the new archbishop who ruled the town, a guy by the name of Hieronymus Colorado, uh, was paying not only uh, Mozart Sr., that is to say, Leopold Mozart, but also Mozart the son, Wolfgang, uh, a pitiful salary, an abysmal sum of something like 300 florins a year and only uh, maybe 450 for the father. Now, those numbers would go up, but still, um, that's not a very impressive salary. Mozart, by his uh, 34th, 35th year, which remember is shortly before he died, is going to be making something closer to 4,000 florins a year. So an order of magnitude more. So he doesn't like Salzburg because, well, his father's there and there's no opera. And generally speaking, there are very few opportunities for him to compose the kind of music he wants to compose. Moreover, he's getting older. He's no longer the charming and um, charismatic boy that he once was. He's now a teenager who's hitting his 20s. And so just after his 20th birthday, his father decides to send young Wolfgang out to travel the roads of Europe once again, uh, hoping that this might result in a job offer, once again, a job offer that would be uh, commensurate with his station as a musician. That is to say, something that would match his incredible gift as a performer, but also as a budding composer, who even by the age of 20, had written uh, a number of celebrated symphonies, for example, the 25th Symphony in G minor, a very, very iconic piece, um, the Ninth Piano Concerto in E flat major, a groundbreaking piece for the genre, uh, the concert motet I mentioned, as well as a couple of operas. Mozart at 20 had done 
um, some very, very impressive work. And so with a portfolio like that, you would imagine that the aristocrats of Europe would be champing at the bit to hire this man and see him employed in their court so that he might be an ornament to their uh, establishment, to their musical establishment. And yet that wasn't the case, certainly not in Salzburg. Mozart's father has no choice but to send the boy off, not alone because he doesn't trust him, he's gonna send him off with Mozart's mother. So Maria, uh, Anna Maria is gonna go for, uh, along for the trip. Three devastating things happen to Mozart along this trip, and yet he manages to write sublime music at nearly every step along the way. It's worth spending some time talking about uh, the moments along the way to Paris. He begins by leaving Austria and heading into Germany, into Bavaria specifically. Those of you who can conjure up the map of Europe will recall that Salzburg, sort of in the northwestern part of, of Austria, as opposed to Vienna, which is on the other side of the country, and uh, therefore it's very close to um, Bavaria. So he heads into Bavaria and visits a couple of towns there. It's worth mentioning these um, stops because they'll be significant. First, he stops in the town of Augsburg, which is actually where his father was born. And there he meets up with his cousin. Um, and the, I mentioned the cousin for two reasons. She's known as the Besle. Besle means the little cousin. Um, when we have the umlaut and the E at the end of the sentence, it is a, at the end of the word, it, it makes it a diminutive version. So the Besle, um, whose name, by the way, was Maria Anna Tekla Mozart. So a lot of Anna Maria's and Maria Anna's in the Mozart family. And um, most scholars agree that this um, woman, girl, was uh, Mozart's first um, amorous uh, relationship of, of any um, seriousness. That is to say, Mozart and his first cousin uh, likely had uh, carnal knowledge of one another, and that may shock some today. Uh, of course, you know, having a, a, an intimate relationship with one's first cousin nowadays, very unusual, perhaps a bit stigmatized, perhaps very stigmatized, depending on where you are. But in the 18th century, that sort of thing was not frowned upon. Uh, it wasn't necessarily encouraged, but it wasn't um, stigmatized as it is today. It didn't have that cloud hanging over it that shocks us when we hear it. Um, it's worth pointing that out for two reasons. One, Mozart exchanged many correspondences with his cousin, and those correspondences give us a wonderful window into Mozart's personality, uh, because he tends to really let loose with de Besle, with his little cousin, uh, who I believe was uh, about a year and a half older than him. So little cousin here is a, a term of affection. She wasn't um, you know, a minor or anything like that, certainly not by the day standards. Uh, as it turns out, Maria Anna Tekla Mozart, Mozart's cousin, um, had something of a reputation in her town, hometown of Augsburg. Um, she was known as a, a Pfaffenschnitzel, which literally means a priest's morsel. And this is a sort of a pejorative term that was used to describe girls who uh, were, uh, again, intimate and amorous with priests. Obviously, priests shouldn't have uh, intimate relationships of that nature, but they did, and the girls with whom they uh, cavorted were known as Pfaffenschnitzels, which is such a funny term, I guess, to an, an English speaker, but it literally means a priest's morsel. Um, so another little wrinkle to the story. But all this is to uh, emphasize uh, one point, which is that Mozart, in his early 20s, is thinking about what most people in their early 20s think about, which is to say sex, love, perhaps marriage. Uh, and that's going to be a big part of this trip. Remember I mentioned that there were three, um, we could call them disasters or uh, you know, tragedies, whatever they were, they were negative events in Mozart's life that took place during this trip. First one, again, his cousin, uh, that's not a, a negative on its own, but in his next stop, he's going to spend a considerable amount of time in the city of Mannheim. Now, Mannheim in Germany at the time had a very famous orchestra. And it was thought that Mozart would be a leading contender to perhaps take the reins of that orchestra. However, he seems to have shot himself in the foot while attending a rehearsal with the um, outgoing Kapellmeister, a guy by the name of Johannes Vogel, Vogel or in English, we would probably say Vogel, um, was a mediocre composer whose name is mostly lost to history, but one of his pieces was being rehearsed and Mozart attended the rehearsal as a guest 
and uh, began to point out all the mistakes in the piece in the composer's presence. So I know this will shock you, but he wasn't offered the job in Mannheim. So where is he off to next? Well, he's gonna stay in Mannheim for a while actually. And it's there that he falls in love. And I mean deeply in love for the first time. Whatever dalliance he had with his cousin was mostly of a sexual nature. There's no evidence to suggest that they were in love. However, in Mannheim, he does fall in love with a 16 year old singer by the name of Aloysia Weber. If you can imagine this, he eventually uh, will marry Aloysia Weber's sister, Constanze Weber. And there were four Weber girls in that family. And it's sort of a strange thing for us to contemplate now, falling deeply in love, being rejected, and then marrying the sibling of the person who spurned you. That's exactly what happened to Mozart, although there is a six year gap from the time he was spurned by Aloysia and the time he marries her sister Constanza in Vienna, many, many years later, many months later, I should say. So that's the first um, disaster that occurs. He falls in love with Aloysia Weber. He writes home to his father. He says, oh, I've met the most amazing prima donna, thinking that she would be a, a great uh, leading lady. That's what prima donna means, a leading lady for the operatic stage. And Leopold says, basically writes back scathingly, you idiot, don't even think about it. I sent you on this trip. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your mother's time. Your objective is to get a job. Forget about the Weber girl. You're making me very sad. Wolfgang, who had been essentially raised by his father and his father alone, he had learned everything he knew from his father, politics, geography, religion, language, music, of course. Um, everything came from this one source, Leopold Mozart. And so to hear such a, such a scathing rebuke from his father, whom he adored so much, uh, but went in, in, uh, in fear of to some degree, uh, it must have really scarred Wolfgang. So again, he's in his early 20s. Uh, he's got romance on the brain and he is rejected first by Leopold. And then when he pursues Aloysia, eventually she too will reject him and, and um, not gently. She's going to be very, very cold um, in her rejection, um, a later generation, a much later generation would call it ghosting, um, which is a term that really is in the vernacular of, you know, my students age um, uh, people, they, the term ghosting really re means to sort of vanish what it sounds like to ignore someone to um, not only to ignore their letters, but in Mozart's case, when he met up with her, eventually, uh, she acted like he wasn't in the room. So, um, so that's the first of, uh, of, of three big um, disasters that ha occurs to Mozart or uh, transpires during this trip uh, where he sets out to obtain meaningful employment at a high court of Europe. And he is rejected um, first from a job in Mannheim, but more importantly for him, I'm sure at the time from this, what he felt was a budding romance with Aloysia Weber. Remember six years later, he's gonna marry her sister Constanza. So, and uh, there's a, even a deeper connection to the Weber family because um, the role of the Queen of the Night, one of the most iconic roles in any of Mozart's operas, indeed, in any opera in the repertoire, um, that role was originated by Mozart's sister-in-law, not Aloysia, a different sister, uh, whose name was Josefa um, Hoffer, née Weber. So it's an amazing story. Mozart really got himself uh, Velcroed in with this Weber family, but I'm sure in 1777, he could have never guessed how things would turn out for him. Let's take a look at some photos, or I should say photos that have been uploaded to the internet. They're portraits, they're paintings. Of course, there's no photos till the mid 19th century. So here is the Mozart family, and you can see here um, one of the tragedies that I foreshadowed earlier, which is the death of Maria Anna Mozart. Uh, there she is up on the wall because when Mozart returned to Salzburg in 1780, she had died. So that's gonna be another of the tragedies that, that occurs during this ill-fated trip. Here's Mozart's sister. Remarkably, um, despite their, their closeness as young children, remember they're on the road together for uh, more than a decade. In fact, uh, they are so close that they uh, not only are playing together and writing together and thinking about music, but everything. They're traveling together. They're inventing all sorts of uh, childlike games together, some of which, by the way, are preserved in the letters that Leopold sent home to uh, Anna Maria when she was um, watching over the, uh, the family 
apartment in uh, Salzburg. Uh, despite this closeness, uh, the two siblings would be estranged by the end of Mozart's life. And, she, and his sister would live to be quite old. She's gonna live into her late seventies. So she's gonna survive her brother by many decades. Mozart, as many of you know, died um, about a month shy of his 36th birthday. By the way, um, before we get to the repertoire, I want to invite anyone who has a question, go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll be uh, glancing up intermittently at intervals and taking uh, questions during the program. As it happened, Mozart's trip um, to Paris, uh, he must have been comforted by his mother's presence because Mozart and his mother had a lot in common. In many ways, a lot more co uh, commonalities than Mozart shared with his father. What do I mean by that? Well, obviously his father was a professional musician and Mozart it must have inherited to some degree, at least his musical gift from Papa Leopold. But it's from his mother that he seems to have inherited his uh, sort of deeply rooted Salzburgian sense of humor. This gives us uh, a moment for a bit of levity and uh, something of an interlude. Mozart and his mother had the same sort of sense of humor. And that sense of humor has been described uh, as vulgar. It's been described as sophomoric. Probably the best word we could use to describe it is scatological. Simply put, Mozart loved the kind of jokes that my two and a half year old daughter Aria loves, which is to say, poop jokes, bathroom jokes, any joke involving an orifice. Uh, Mozart seems to have loved those kinds of jokes. They come up in about 20% of his letters that are preserved for posterity. And uh, he seems to have inherited that sense of humor directly from Mama uh, Maria Anna Mozart. So it's, it's sort of interesting to consider how this has played into his biographies, especially in the early days and his legacy. In the early Mozart biographies, um, many of the early writers neglected to mention this. They didn't want it included in the 19th century publications. And the reason was because it, um, it seemed incongruous with his status as a sort of a, you know, a paradigmatic genius of Western art. How can you be a genius, a child prodigy, a virtuoso performer, uh, an exceptionally gifted, um, not just a, a musician, but also an exceptionally gifted dancer, uh, facile in, more than four languages at least, um, capable of, of um, writing with great fluidity backwards. You know, Mozart could speak backwards and write backwards. Now that's something most of us have to think about if we wanted to do it. Mozart could do it with great fluidity. How does a brain with so many synapses firing, how do, do the 19th century uh, biographers, how could they have squared that with his overtly scatological sense of humor? And the answer is they just omitted that last detail. It was incongruous to them. It was at odds. A, a genius should be someone who is uh, worthy of deep reverence and veneration. Um, you know, can we worship somebody? Can we put him on a pedestal if uh, he had the sense of humor of a toddler? Um, the answer, of course, for us today is yes. But the early 19th century writers had a problem with this. And in fact, um, some of the early editions of some of Mozart's music, which is uh, which of a scatological bent occasionally, uh, was edited with revised text and titles. Uh, let's look at an example of that. Here is a piece um, that Mozart wrote when he was a teenager. This is a piece that dates uh, when he was about 15 when he wrote this, and he was in Italy at the time. Uh, the title probably does not need to be translated, but I'll pronounce it out loud anyway. It's called Leck mich im Arsch. You can guess what that means. If anybody is still not sure, feel free to uh, private message me and I'll be sure to smarten you up. It's a six voice canon. In other words, it's a piece written in imitation for six voices. And the six voices are all singing the same thing, but not at the same time. Think of row, row, row your boat or something like that, where the lines overlap to create harmony when you have staggered entrances. Except here, the words are clearly um, a little bit more adult than row, row, row your boat. Leck mich im Arsch means exactly what you think it means. Lasst uns froh sein means let us be happy. In other words, Mozart probably wrote this uh, as a kind of 
uh, carousing and drinking song, not for himself necessarily, because he was a teenager, but remember as a teenager, he's mostly rubbing elbows and hobnobbing with professional musicians, the sort that are playing his music, for example. So um, you can imagine Mozart spending his evenings with these sort of rough and tough uh, um, musician types who are clanking their beer steins in the taverns where Mozart and his father hung out. And, um, and so he gets this idea to write Lech mich, Lech mich im Arsch. Let's listen to it. And then we will uh, uh, talk about how this kind of music squares with the, our notion of genius, how it squares with our conception of brilliance, and if it is indeed something that is able to be reconciled with uh, everything we've talked about so far. <laughs> the words here, by the way, knurren brummen ist vergebens, uh, ist das wahre Kreuz das, uh, des Lebens, the genitive case. Um, Knurren Wurm is grumbling, moaning. Uh, that's all, you know, don't do this. Uh, ist vergebens means it's, uh, it's something you don't want to do. You want to avoid that. Uh, Drum lass uns froh sein means, therefore, let us instead be happy. Let us be cheerful. Let us be merry. Uh, ist das wahre Kreuz des Lebens. The grumbling, the moaning, complaining, that's the true uh, Kreuz actually means cross. In this case, we could say the, the trial of life. In other words, that's our, our trial is to avoid grumbling, to avoid moaning. You can emo almost imagine teenage Mozart doubling over, belly laughing uh, as his musician friends sing this with him. The way it's arranged is so that every four bars, we hear a fresh lek mich im Arsch, lek mich im Arsch. So while all this um, contrapuntal madness is spinning out as these voices interact, we have this refrain that sounds, and again, it needs no translation. So Mozart clearly inherited uh, this sense of humor from his mother. And I say clearly because if you read the mother's letters, most of which um, from this period survive, uh, it seems like half of them are filled with references to bodily function in a humorous way. Lech mich im Arsch. Um, I once did an experiment with my students at Nagatech Valley Community College after we had been studying Renaissance and Baroque music, much of which is of a sacred nature. Um, I played this for them to start the classical period. And I said, well, um, what do you think this is about? You know, unless you speak German, it would be hard to know. And uh, one student boldly raised his hand and he said, sounds like some kind of church piece, professor. And of course, if you study Renaissance and Baroque music and you hear the sound of an a cappella group and you hear imitative counterpoint, you might think it is a church piece, but of course, this is the farthest thing from a church piece. All right, before we get to the Paris phase, I see we've got some questions, so let's go ahead and get to them. Uh, Linda says, I watched a movie about Mozart and his sister in their early years. The movie focused quite a bit on the sister and showed she was also a musical genius, right? This is all correct, I'm kind of skipping ahead. Um, okay, so it, great question about the sister Nanero Mozart, also named um, uh, Anna Maria Mozart. The, the limitations uh, for women in the 18th century, not just in music, but in life in general, were substantial. In music, a woman could theoretically become a big star and a very highly paid musician, but really only as an opera star, only as a, a, a diva or a prima donna, as the, the term prima donna, as I said earlier, comes from opera, a leading lady. Prima literally means first lady, but obviously first lady in English has a totally different meaning. So we'll say leading lady. So a woman could become a very successful musician, but really it was limited to the realm of opera. Uh, were there female composers? Sure, um, there are a few female composers that have, um, uh, justifiably, I think, in recent years and in recent um, textbooks and and, um, and scholarly writing, gotten a lot of attention. Barbara Strozzi from the uh, Baroque period, Fanny Mendelssohn, many of you will be familiar with, the sister of Felix Mendelssohn, uh, Clara Schumann. I just uh, asked the NBCC library to order a book on Clara Schumann fairly recently, actually, uh, a new book. So um, there were some women who did pursue careers as composers. Um, unfortunately, Nanero was not one of them. Actually, her life is, uh, is very 
strange, to be honest. Um, the first 20 years or so are filled with charming stories of performances and virtuoso displays and um, moments of what, what could have only been um, profound pride for the Mozart family. And then uh, Leopold married her off to a man who was uh, significantly older. And she moved to a, a backwater town called St. Gilgen and uh, she gave up music completely. The man she married had, I think, five children from a previous marriage. And so between those five kids and the kids that she would bear for him, I think she had three kids with um, her husband. Uh, apparently between that, she, she either didn't have time or lost the, uh, the impetus to, um, to compose. And as I mentioned earlier, um, she and Mozart became estranged. So we lose, we, that is to say, posterity loses track of her when she stops corresponding with her brother once he moves to Vienna. So how much of it is true? Well, she was a brilliant musician, no question about it. However, um, was she a prolific composer? Not at all. Did she compose at all? There's not a lot of evidence to suggest that she did. And again, that was really the, um, a, a sad, tragic limitation uh, that a woman like Nanarol would have faced in the late 18th century. Okay, great. Uh, I see we have got more questions. I'm so happy to say, by the way, that thanks to the Darien Library, this um, investigation of Mozart's life and works uh, will continue. We've got uh, three more programs planned for the coming months, one in October, one in November, and one in December. So stay tuned. If we don't cover everything today, we will get to it. Um, uh, let's see, question. Even for that time, 36 was on the young side to pass. That is correct, absolutely. Um, forgive my, but did he die from an acute disease or suffer from something chronic? Uh, it was a sudden illness that took him in late November of 1791. Uh, most musicologists who obviously are not medical doctors, but have combed the medical scholarship. There are doctors and uh, forensic pathologists and others who have gone over this. Maynard Solomon's biography covers it in detail. Uh, most people agree that Mozart died of kidney failure from some kind of infection. Nobody's exactly sure what. Actually, we could talk a lot about that as well, uh, but we'll, we'll address it in the uh, future programs, but probably just a, a kidney infection that took him late November, two weeks later, he was dead by December 5th. Uh, Ethan says, are there any notable responses to any of the more scatological music similar? Yeah. So the, um, the response in the scholarship to Lech Michim Arsh, in the early editions, the words were changed and the title of the piece was changed. Um, and again, early publishers, early biographers, they, they didn't want it known that Mozart was such a fiend that he had this uh, incredibly sophomoric sense of humor because to reiterate, they felt that it was somehow at odds with his status as a, as a genius, that you can't be a genius if your mind's in the gutter. Well, of course we know that's not true. Uh, was Mozart religious? Did he go to church? Great question. Mozart lived, remember, uh, sort of during the climax of the Enlightenment, in the late 18th century. It's a remarkable time. We could talk about it all night. But uh, it's worth pointing out that Mozart was Catholic, baptized Catholic. He was religious when it suited him, and he wrote liturgical music, uh, over 20 settings of the Mass Ordinary. Uh, but overall, I would say it's fair to, to, to uh, assert that Mozart was not religious. And there's a very telling piece of evidence that tells us this. And it is the following. In 1784, when Mozart was just shy of his 30th birthday, he joined the Freemasons. So a, a really devout person would not have joined the Freemasons. And we'll talk more about the Masons in future programs. Great question. Terrific. And I see uh, Amanda has linked the book. Excellent. Amanda, I don't know if, um, if you can look up another book that I strongly recommend. It's called Mozart's Letters, Mozart's Life. The author's name is Robert, I would say Spätling, but let's spell it in English, S-P-A-E-T-H-L-I-N-G. Spätling, I guess. I'll take a look. Yeah, Spätling is how uh, it really should be pronounced, but in English, Spätling. See, that doesn't sound right. All right. Mozart arrives in Paris and um, it's disappointment after disappointment. But again, there's some beautiful music intertwined with his arrival in Paris. Let's start with the, uh, the more um, blunted and mild disappointments. Obviously he didn't get a full-time job offer. So that was a disappointment. The good news is that Paris had one of the best orchestras in Europe, a group known as the Concert Spirituel. 
And this group was really a pioneering ensemble because they were, for the first time in history, selling subscription season tickets to come see their orchestra play. Now that doesn't sound strange to us. We're used to uh, music being consumed by audiences that take their disposable income to buy a ticket to go see a performance by an orchestra. That's actually a fairly novel idea in Europe in the 18th century. And it's not really until after uh, the 1760s that the Concert Spirituel begins to gain traction, begins to uh, gain steam, if you will, as um, uh, in terms of establishing this new template, whereby, once again, for the first time in, in European history, the average person, whether you're a, a cobbler, that is to say someone who fixes shoes, or a chandler, someone who, you know, uh, makes um, barrels, or a wheel, a, you know, a wainwright, somebody who makes wagon wheels, or a tailor, or a, whatever it is, uh, you could take your earnings and go buy a ticket to go see the Concert Spirituel in, in Paris, in France. So it's a pretty remarkable um, thing that we might easily overlook, nonetheless. There are, of course, the usual um, maladies that struck uh, travelers when they visited big cities like Paris. Remember that drinking water came from the local river, that would be the Seine, and that um, people drank from the Seine, but they also deposited their night soil in the Seine. And so there were all sorts of pathogens swimming around that people didn't know about. They understood that they had to boil their water um, but nonetheless, uh, travelers could expect to be sick for a couple of weeks before they recovered. And that was true of visiting most towns. Although in a town like Salzburg, where you were up in the mountains, uh, the water obviously would be a lot cleaner, a lot more reliable uh, in terms of um, uh, water quality. So they get to Paris. Mozart um, uh, introduces himself to the local uh, musicians, so some of whom he knew from previous acquaintances during his travels. He writes a symphony for uh, the Concert Spirituel, it's symphony number 31 in D major. We won't have time to look at it today. To be honest, it's a very um, ho-hum piece. It's in, not my favorite of Mozart's 41 symphonies. It's a work that is more about gesture and instrumentation than it is about melody. So if you would, in other words, if you listen to it, you wouldn't come away with a tune that would be stuck in your ear the way that many of Mozart's symphonies uh, sort of put those orvorm. Orvorm is a German term, literally means an earworm. Um, number 31 is noteworthy because it's the first time that we have Mozart including clarinets in the instrumentation of the symphony. So it's expanding his palette and Mozart eventually developed a, a love affair with the clarinet. I think it's, it's reasonable to say that the clarinet was his favorite of all wind instruments, perhaps one of his favorite instruments. And we'll talk about it uh, further down the road in this lecture series when we talk about the clarinet concerto and the clarinet quintet in A major. So um, what are the significant pieces that he writes? Well, he's going to write, I would say, uh, the most noteworthy concerto of this period, which is the concerto for flute and harp in C major. Most of Mozart's music is in a major key, right? Major keys tend to leave us feeling very buoyant, ebullient, euphoric even. Uh, and about 90% of Mozart's music, perhaps even more actually, are in minor keys. 90% of his music is in a minor key. Um, and the concerto for flute and harp represents sort of the apogee of this sunny, warm, major key sound that he was so adept at wielding. The story about how he came to write a concerto for, of all instruments, flute and harp, is an interesting one. And it has to do with uh, Mozart taking on students uh, to pay the bills. Most musicians have to do this at some point. Some musicians really like taking on private lessons. Others, like Mozart, despise it. Nonetheless, he was working with a teenage girl who was apparently an incredibly adept uh, harpist. That is to say, she played the upright pedal harp, which Mozart probably regarded as like a, an inside out piano uh, played on its side. Uh, so he wasn't a harpist, but he understood how the instrument worked. And um, he taught her, she was the, uh, the daughter of the Duc de Guine. And so therefore these lessons would have been a lucrative source of, of income for him while he's traveling. You know, traveling is expensive. You've got to pay for your lodging. You've got to pay for every meal. Um, and so therefore uh, these lessons were necessary. Mozart didn't mind teaching the girl, but as it turned out, her father, the Duc de Guine was not in a hurry to pay him for the lessons. When uh, the father offered Mozart a commission to write a concerto, Mozart obliged and he wrote this brilliant concerto for harp, soloist, and also for flute. The father was a flute player. Uh, the Duke de Guin never paid Mozart for it. 
You paid him half of what he owed him for the lessons and that was it. So once again, another disappointment in Paris, uh, layered on the various disappointments along the way in this trip, his um, sp being spurned by Aloysia Weber, no meaningful job offer, and finally, um, you know, another insult to add insult to injury here in Paris, the Duc de Guine refuses to pay him for the concerto for flute and harp. Well, that's just a wrinkle in the story. Most people remember this piece because it's one of the most brilliant concerti that he wrote. And you have to recall at the time of the writing, Mozart is all of 21 and a half at the time of the writing of this concerto. So it's a brilliant piece. Let's go ahead and listen to the finale, which I think um, uh, folks will really enjoy. And I see that the library has Mozart's letters, Mozart's life, fantastic. All right, here we go. This is an excellent uh, performance from the uh, Israel Philharmonic Orchestra conducted by Zubin Mehta. We're only gonna have time to look at the third and final movement. In a concerto, you get three movements, typically in the order fast movement, slow movement, fast movement, and um, we're gonna listen to the finale. You can see there the solo instruments. Remember that a concerto is essentially a piece for orchestra with obligato soloists. Obligato means very specific soloists, so a flute and a harp. Let's go ahead and jump right into the movement. You can see the tapping of the feet from the orchestra. Sometimes they'll sort of uh, lightly tap their bows against the instrument. But an excellent performance of this very demanding concerto. Most concerti are, are demanding, but this one obviously calls for a unique pair of soloists. And again, had it not been for that miserly and parsimonious Duke de Guine, we would never have gotten this concerto. So even though he was a miser and refused to pay Mozart uh, the amount that he owed him, uh, his involvement in Mozart's life still uh, netted posterity this incredible concerto. I see we've got a question. Uh, Ethan asks, did Mozart's time in Paris transpire uh, during the time in history uh, where musicians were still widely regarded as servants? Yes, that's right. Uh, in the 1770s, and really up until the early 19th century, musicians were still regarded as servants. They were still regarded as artists, that is the craftsmen, uh, people who had a particular function in a court or in a household. They were not esteemed and revered as creators and as um, sort of unique artists whose ideas coalesced in an inimitable fashion. That um, new ethos is going to materialize in the early 19th century, largely due to the innovations of Beethoven. So Mozart's still living in a time where musicians are treated as, uh, as servants, and that's going to factor prominently into his decision to leave Salzburg and to seek his own fortune as a freelancing musician in Vienna. All right. We now come to the third and final tragedy that befell Mozart during this trip. Remember, we said that the first two calamities were the lack of a job offer and uh, the uh, catastrophic, disastrous end of his um, short-lived relationship with Aloysia Weber. So those were the two heartbreaks so far. But the, the biggest and most devastating heartbreak was right around the corner and it took place in the summer of 1778. Let's go back to our pictures. That is to say portraits, pictures of portraits. Here's Leopold Mozart, here's uh, Maria Anna Mozart, and she is going to take ill in Paris and, uh, and die within a couple of weeks. And this is going to lead to a couple of things which are noteworthy for us. Number one, it's going to lead to a fraying of the relationship between Mozart and his father to an extreme degree. Again, this is going to really influence Mozart, I think, to a tremendous extent to leave Salzburg and eventually to get as far away from his father as he could, which in this case meant going to Vienna. What happened to uh, Mozart's mother is not really widely understood. Um, the nature of medicine in the late 18th century, there's an expression we use to describe it. And that is this, if one recovered from a serious illness, it was more likely, uh, you were more likely to recover despite the doctors rather than because of the doctors. In other words, the uh, medicines of the time were so primitive uh, that they actually had a detrimental effect on health. Let me give you one example. A very common medicine that was administered to sick patients at the time was um, a sort of a tincture that was uh, made up of powdered ground up deer antlers, uh, powdered eggshells, 
and other emetics that essentially forced the, uh, the patient to violently vomit. And the physicians of the time felt that um, if you wanted to heal somebody, you had to balance the four humors within the body. And so they employed all sorts of strange, quote, you know, quote unquote, medicines. They employed uh, techniques that you've heard and read about, like bleeding, deliberately bleeding. And of course, if someone is sick and you bleed them or you dehydrate them by forcing them to vomit, you're also only going to hasten their demise by draining whatever vitality they have. So to this day, nobody is quite sure uh, how Mozart's mother, Anna Maria Mozart, died. Uh, we aren't even sure how Mozart himself died. There are some leading theories, but nobody is sure, and I don't think anybody ever will be. But when it comes to his mother, the only witnesses were a 22-year-old who was scared out of his mind. Um, and uh, the other uh, figures who were there were sort of peripheral figures who had no vested interest in determining exactly what was killing the mother. It was a very tragic ending for uh, Mozart's mom because she was alone in Paris. Mozart spent most of the days out and about in the city trying to forge connections, uh, uh, get uh, commissions and honoraria through commissions, um, and hobnobbing with other musicians. And plus Mozart was fluent in French and he was uh, younger, more nimble. His mother was in her late fifties. She didn't speak any French. And so she basically shut up in an apartment um, or more or less around the clock. And uh, for her to get sick, it was, must have been terrible for, for Wolfgang to, uh, to witness uh, the rapid deterioration of her health. What's strange and even more tragic about her demise is that after she died, Mozart wrote a letter to his father in which he wrote that his mother is sick. And he's not sure you know, what's going to happen, but he's praying to God and it's all in God's hands now. Let me repeat that. His mother was already dead. The first thing he does is he writes a letter to his father saying that mama's sick and it's all in God's hands now. Well, by invoking God, uh, Mozart was actually being quite clever here because he knew that his father was a very devout man, although also a man of the Enlightenment. Leopold was certainly, uh, from a doctrinal perspective, more observant than, than his son was. When Mozart finally works up the courage to let Leopold know that his, his wife is dead, that is to say that mama is dead, Leopold writes back with one of the most heartbreaking responses. He writes back, and I quote, <clears throat> if I had been there, your mother would still be alive. The implication being, Mozart, you killed your mother. Uh, Wolfgang, you killed your mother. So the, um, I mentioned earlier, Leopold Mozart, here he is uh, in an earlier portrait. He's a polarizing figure, uh, not an altogether sympathetic one. And, and I think it is the perspective of most musicologists and music historians that Leopold was uh, not a very <clears throat> uh, friendly, not a very empathetic, and not a very uh, affable man. He was very businesslike. One of the strangest things that he did in his life is he hoarded money during the children's childhood tours, and he didn't give them a cent of it. Uh, until he died, and then it was bequeathed to them. Uh, not only that, he put them under the impression that they were all poor, and that um, you know they were a drain on his finances. So again, uh, something on the order of a heel, Leopold Mozart was. But nonetheless, in the aftermath of um, Anna Maria Mozart's death, young Wolfgang, who remember is 22 at this time, in the summer of 1778, is going to write one of his most expressive piano sonatas. Uh, in the entire catalog. I mentioned earlier that most of Mozart's works are in major keys. This one is in a minor key. And it's very tempting to say with concrete certainty that Mozart wrote it in a minor key because he was dejected, depressed, in a pit of despair, and therefore found the minor key more suitable for venting his frustration, his, uh, his agony, whatever it was. And that may very well be the case. But the thing is, in musicology, we can't say that for sure unless the composer tells us in no uncertain terms. This is sometimes uh, called the, the fallacy of composer intention, that we sometimes listen to pieces and we go, oh, it sounds like this because uh, you know, the composer uh, had food poisoning that weekend, and so therefore um, you know, th this part is dissonant. Well, of course, I'm making that particular detail up, but the point is, um, it's very tempting to read it that way. What we can say instead is, that the minor key has a mournful quality that seems uh, not only congruent, but also appropriate for uh, 
uh, this period where young 22-year-old Mozart was in a period of uh, profound sadness, what could only have been devastating sadness, not just at the loss of his mother. Remember, he is about three weeks carriage ride from home by himself, and he's just gotten a scathing letter from his father, basically accusing him of being responsible for mom's death. So uh, this sonata is um, often remarked upon as, as one of the most spellbinding of all Mozart sonatas. We're going to watch a great video here on YouTube performed by Kumar Rousseau, who uh, she um, does these great videos that give us an overhead shot of the piano, but also this almost video game like guitar hero like presentation of the tones flying away as the performer plays. I want to just point out something before it starts. You can see in the very first scenario, do you see these two neighboring tones? If you look at the pianist's hands, you'll see that she's got her index finger on a D sharp and the middle finger on an E natural. And this sort of thing gives us an uncharacteristically pungent uh, sonority to begin the piece. It's, it's ephemeral, it goes by very quickly, but this D sharp E gives the piece not only the quality of a minor key, but of this dissonant um, neighbor tone to the fifth scale degree. You know, my music theory students would probably love to analyze something like this. Um, for us uh, here this evening, we can just say, let's bend our ears uh, towards those dissonances and see if we can detect them as they come up. See if we can um, perceive the minor key and that baleful dollarous quality that it imbues this piece with. So obviously it starts in minor and you'll notice it turns to major. That's nothing more than convention here. We're not through the first movement. In fact, we're only through the exposition, which repeats. In the 18th century, music was loaded with repeats. Re music was repeated all the time put two dots in the score and tell the musicians to go back and play it sometimes exactly as they played it verbatim, sometimes with minor ornamentation. You have to remember in an era that predates recording technology by more than a hundred years, um, audiences craved opportunities to hear music. And when they did get to hear music, it was very special. And when they got to hear this special music, it was often repeated so that it would burrow into the ear, into the tympanium of the listener so that the listener might better remember it after the concert concluded. So today there is this ongoing question with performance ensembles around the world at the very highest level. Should we retake the repeats as the 18th century musicians wrote them? After all, now we have, um, recording technologies that allow us to fast forward and skip ahead. We could scrub ahead uh, with the flick of the wrist, a, a touch of the finger. So is it really necessary to um, have those repeats? It's an ongoing debate, but I'm going to skip the repeat for now and take us into the development section, which is nothing short of breathtaking. Um, breathtaking because of how shockingly, remarkably dissonant it is. This is the kind of dissonance that we're not gonna get in music for another 20 years at least until Beethoven and the Pathetique Sonata perhaps. Uh, it's a remarkably forward looking development section and we're gonna hear uh, it in just a few moments. And all, vacillating, you notice um, her fingers, thumb on um, B and index finger on A sharp, constantly wobbling back and forth very rapidly. Not a trill exactly, but a measured, uh, tremolo of sorts, above this, what we call pedal point tone. This is a sustained tone. You'll hear that B for a while. Listen to how dissonant the tones are above. When the bass moves, we're going to get the same phrase repeated at different pitch and uh, different uh, pitch levels. Okay, it does repeat once again, but uh, that's really the end of the movement. Remarkable, the ending really anticipates Beethoven, expressive harmony, what we call Neapolitan six chords, a sort of dark uh, flavored chord that um, sits on a flatted second scale degree, diminished chords, unstable, begging for resolution. And when we finally get it, it's to the tonic key of A minor, which leaves us feeling admittedly less chipper than a piece in A major would. The concerto for flute and harp leaves us feeling very sunny and satisfied. This piece maybe leaves us feeling satisfied, but I don't think anyone would describe it as, as uh, having us uh, feeling sunny. So um, let's go ahead and uh, look at the remaining questions. And uh, I, I wanna just thank everybody for attending the program tonight. Reminder, 
that we have three more of these programs. So we're all gonna be um, Mozart scholars in our own right by the end of December. Uh, let's take a look at um, the Q&A. Ethan asks, um, okay, I think we answered that one. So let me mark that as answered, yep. Any other questions about what we talked about tonight? Obviously in our next program, we'll pick up the story after Mozart returns from this disastrous trip to Paris, comes back to Salzburg, but he doesn't last very long there. First, he sets out to Munich to the court of Elector Karl Theodor, where he's going to write one of probably the first truly great opera of his life, which was Idomineo, King of Crete, Idomineo, Re de Creta, uh, which is the last opera he's gonna write to feature a, a prominent castrato in the solo role. Uh, Mozart sort of had it with Castrati by 1781. And in 1781, he's going to make the biggest decision of his life up until that point, which is to cut his ties with Salzburg and to um, get himself deliberately dismissed from the archbishop's service so that he can go to Vienna, and make his way as a freelance musician. It's an exciting time for him. It's also a very terrifying time, filled with triumphs and successes and also plenty of letdowns. But I think it's fair to say that after what he endured in 1777-78 on this trip to Paris, Mozart emerged. Uh, you know, he went as a child and he came back as an adult, and not just an adult, but an adult who had endured serious tragedy and emerged uh, the stronger for it. So we're certainly set up for our next program. I see we've got a um, question. Did he have a spectacular exit? Uh, not from Paris. No, he kind of... Uh, it was more like he, he uh, did a bit of slinking to, to leave, uh, but he does have a spectacular exit from the Archbishop's service, and um, perhaps this is a good place to end. In the 18th century, you could have just put in your two weeks notice. You didn't just let your employer know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to be moving on in a couple of weeks. Uh, in fact, if your employer said, you know, you have to come to work, you have to come to work. And so uh, Mozart realizing he couldn't quit, contrived to get himself fired. And so what he did was um, he basically uh, became very insubordinate, insubordinate and even churlish, you could say, even churlish to the, towards uh, this man who was uh, many, many rungs above him on the social ladder. And so finally he got himself uh, dismissed from the archbishop's service by the, the steward of the, the uh, archbishop. His name was Count Arco. And as it's recorded, uh, he dismissed Mozart literally with a kick in the rear. <laughs> so I guess you could say he had a, uh, anything but a spectacular exit from the Archbishop's service, but nonetheless has made its way into history as a, a sort, of, sort of comical footnote in this uh, particular chapter. Thank you so much, Gil. This was wonderful and delightful. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you to the library and to the Friends of the Darien Library for sponsoring events like this one it's so great to keep the uh, the learning going while we are um, you know still making our way out there's light at the end of the tunnel and uh, and here we are uh, keeping the flame going as uh, as we make our way into the fall happy autumn everybody yeah we're only going to be doing the best of the best that's why you're here <laughs> I did put a link in for um, our next program in this series so please sign up it is for Wednesday October 20th same time, same place, um, new link. So please join us. Excellent. Have a good night, everybody. Enjoy. Thank you.